talking about instruments and principles for instrumentation. Chapter 37. To identify the three main parts of a periodontal instrument, differentiate among various types of removal instruments based on their design, state the identification and contraindication for the use of various removal instruments, describe and demonstrate fundamental techniques for manual and powered instrumentation, and practice exercises that are designed to develop hand dexterity and prevent trauma. Rules of instrumentation include fulcruming for stabilization and correct grasp, adaptation, angulation, and activation. Normal instruments refers to instruments used around the teeth. There are a number of available instruments and designs available for use, so we need to understand how to identify the instrument and use the instrument properly. Overview of instruments, instrument classification, you have assessment and deposit removal. Instrument identification is going to be based on the instrument design, the design name, and the design number. When it comes to instrument design, I'm sorry, instrument identification, each instrument can be identified at a glance by the design. Design name. Popular instruments are usually named after institutions like your UNC 15, which is from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. The, U, the TU-17 Explorer was named after Tufts University and the ODU-1112 was named after Old Dominion University. Other instruments are named after individuals. That includes your Gracie Curettes and your Nevite Scalers. Your design number. Instruments are designated by a number followed by the design name. The number indicates the specific design of the working end. Instrument design. There are three major parts of a periodontal instrument and includes the handle, the shank, and the working end. You can see that on this picture here. So the handle comes in various forms. The thicker the handle, the better at reducing muscle skeletal disorders on the hand and the wrist. The weight. Handles may be heavy and composed of solid metal, or they may be lightweight and hollow. Handles with lighter weight enhance tactile sensitivity and lessen fatigue related to tighter grasp. Ergonomic handles ideally weigh less than 15 grams. The diameter. They vary widely. Standard handles that are 6.5 millimeters in diameter to larger handles that are 10 millimeters in diameter. Instruments with thin, small diameter handles increase muscle activity and pinch force, which over time can lead to muscle skeletal injuries. So your ergonomic instruments are going to have the 10 millimeter diameter handle. Texture. Handles can have smooth or varying degrees of raised textures. A smooth handle may require you to grasp it a little bit tighter 
which can lessen that tactile sensitivity and increase your muscle fatigue, right? You have ribbed or knurled patterns and serrations that can provide better control. The shank is a portion of the instrument which connects the working end to the handle. Between the working end and the first bend is your terminal shank, also known as the lower shank. And this can provide you with a cue for correct working and identification and positioning for treatment. The shank, the shape, the length, and the rigidity of the shank governs access to the working end to various teeth. So if that shank is a simple shank, meaning it's got a straight, straight shank, that lets you know it's made for anterior teeth. Okay, instruments with complex shanks that have multiple bends in there are made for posterior teeth. The more rigid the shank is, you know that it's supposed to be used for more difficult and tenacious calculus. So again, the shape of it can be simple or straight, or it can be angled and complex. So the more difficult it is to access the tooth surface and the deeper the bends there are in the shank. The length The length can vary. But usually the shank the end the working end to the junction between the shank and the handle is 35 to 40 mm. If the distance is too short, it limits the action subgingively. So you have instruments that are after fives. They call them after fives, which means that they're made or meant to be used in deeper periodontal pockets. Rigidity. I talked about this already, but shanks of varying degrees of thickness and rigidity. A thicker shank is stronger and is able to withstand greater pressure that's applied when needed to remove heavy calculus deposits. Flexible shanks are less, a little less rigid. They're thinner and they may provide more tactile sensitivity and may be used for removal of finer deposits of calculus and for root debridement. Your working end. You have a single end, double end, or paired. Okay, you have a paired or unpaired. So this one that we're looking at right here, this is paired. An unpaired could be mean that it has a totally different end to it, right? So take, for instance, your explorer, that's unpaired because on one end, it's the shepherd's hook, and on the other end is the TU-17. All right, let's talk about the parts of a cure blade. So, you have your face, which is here. This is your face. The edges of this are your cutting edges, which would be these marked by C. And then you have your toe or tip. So your curette is gonna have a toe. Your sickle scaler is going to have a tip. Then you have your lateral surfaces lateral surfaces okay your cutting edge is where your face and the lateral surface meet then you have the back 
of your instrument, which is like a half moon shape. Okay, the back of your curette is a half moon shape or a semicircular in cross section. So here are examples of those textures on the handles. You can see there's different textures on that handle and the diameters are also different. So you see this a lot in private practices. The dentists normally have these for their mouth mirrors and most of their instruments, okay? We want to use the thicker ones with some kind of pattern on them, the knurling, to help us better grip it and so we don't have to put as much pinch force on them. Now, your book did mention that the lighter the instrument, right, these hollow plastic ones are lighter and they help with muscle skeletal disorders, but think about it. What is going to give you more vibrations through the handle? Is it gonna be plastic or is it going to be metal? grass and fulcrums. The dominant hand is used to grasp and activate the treatment instrument. The way the instrument is held is <laughs> influences the entire procedure. Appropriate grasp helps prevent fatigue in the fingers and provides control of the instrument with balance and decreases trauma to the tissues. Your non-dominant hand is used for supplementary functions such as holding the mirror and assisting the dominant hand with an auxiliary finger rest. The palm grasp is used to grasp the air and water syringe and when stabilizing the instrument for sharpening. The modified pen grasp is a three finger grasp with specific target points. The instrument is held by the pads of the thumb and index finger. The middle finger is placed on the upper portion of the shank to guide the movement of the instrument. The ring finger is used to establish the fulcrum. The fulcrum is a support beam which helps lever turns and pivots. It provides stability so the whole hand can move as a unit and provides control of the stroke which can prevent injury and irregular pressure. It also provides patient comfort as the patient may feel a sense of security of when applied instrumentation strokes and control. The effective wrist position. So ideally we wanna be in a neutral wrist position to help prevent carpal tunnel and muscle skeletal disorders that can be created through the pressure on the median nerve an incorrect work habit. The wrist should be straight and the forearm and hand are in the same horizontal plane when in neutral position. We wanna avoid bending the wrist like this because it pinches the median nerve and this transverse carpal tunnel ligament. It puts a lot of pressure on the wrist and it's very painful. And then if you get carpal tunnel, sometimes they'll put, they'll start by putting steroid shots and then they have to end up doing surgery. The intraoral fulcrum is a finger rest inside the patient's mouth. It serves to provide stabilization of the hand during instrumentation. 
fingers are grouped together. The ideal for fulcrum is firm and stable adjacent to the tooth that's being treated. It is on the same arch and quadrant as the tooth being treated and it allows convenient access to the working area and allows for easy instrumentation, adaptation, and stability. It also allows for control and prevents accidental finger injury and promotes effective grasp of the instrument. An extraoral fulcrum is used when an intraoral fulcrum cannot be established. It's typically used in difficult to access areas such as the maxillary posterior regions. The cheek and chin are most commonly used. Secure fulcrum is dependent on pressure against the face and the underlying bone. The grasp needs to be modified so that it's further from the working end then it would be used with the traditional intraoral fulcrum. So notice her fingers. When I tell you that you have to hold on to the instrument handle higher up than that terminal shank, this is what I mean. So normally your middle finger would be right here, but because you are doing an extraoral fulcrum, let's say you were actually scaling the most posterior molar, you're going to have to adjust the way you hold on to this instrument, okay? Even if this was fulcrumed intraorally, you would fulcrum here closer to these three teeth in order to scale the most posterior molar. Alternative fulcrums are used in instances where establishing an intraoral or extraoral fulcrum is not possible. Reasons include the patient has a small mouth or the patient is having difficulty opening or the patient maybe has a large tongue. This can also be necessary with edentulous areas. For instrument adaptation, you want to select the end of the instrument the, the, or the correct end of the instrument. The toe or tip third is adapted to the contour of the tooth. Two to three millimeters of the tip or the toe of the third of the leading third are adapted. You want to line the angles. I'm sorry, the line angles require instruments to be rolled between the fingers for correct adaptation to the tooth. So these leading, this in green is what you wanna use, right? So you go from green to yellow to red. So instrumentation basics, Angulation, so the angle is formed between the working end and the tooth surface. The probe is maintained the side of the tip on the tooth with the long axis parallel to the root surface. For the explorer, the tip is kept adapted to the tooth at all times, approximately five degrees or less. For the scalar or curette, it goes in at zero degrees closed, and then the face is flat against the tooth surface to prevent tissue trauma when inserting it into the pocket. Then you open it up to 70 degrees for effective calculus removal. So here's what I'm talking about. So you're going to gently insert this at zero degrees, which means you have to close this and have it go right up against the tooth enamel so that you're not causing any damage back of the instrument is smooth, so it's not going to harm or hurt the tissues. Then once you get to the base of the pocket, 
and you've gone over the calculus that you're trying to remove, you're going to open up this instrument to 70 degrees to then perform a calculus removal stroke. So let's talk about activation of the stroke. So activation is the unbroken movement made by an instrument. It's necessary to have stability during the stroke. The entire hand pivots or rotates on the fulcrum and motion is generated by a unified action of the shoulder, the arm, the wrist, and the hand. The length of the length of the stroke is limited by the extent of the calculus deposit. There are various types of strokes, including your walking stroke that's used with the probe, your exploratory stroke that's used with your explorer, your checking for calculus, and then in your calculus removal stroke. which is going to be what's used to remove those calculus. So lateral pressure refers to the pressure of the instrument that's applied against the tooth surface during activation. It can be light, moderate, or heavy. The balance of pressure is necessary for control. Equal forces will facilitate stable and tensional control of the instrument. Effects of ex excessive pressure include gouging of root surfaces, loss of instrument control, patient discomfort, and clinician fatigue. So here are your different stroke directions. So you have your vertical strokes, which run parallel to the long axis of the tooth. Then you have your horizontal strokes, which run parallel to the occlusal surface of the tooth that's being treated. Then you have your oblique strokes, which are diagonal to the long axis of the tooth that's being treated. The walking stroke is used with a probe using a light grasp, light pressure, and vertical up and down small incremental strokes. The exploratory stroke is used with the explorer and removal instruments. It's used to maximize tactile sensitivity and detect irregularities. It's also used with power instrumentations using a light grasp and light pressure. Strokes include vertical, horizontal, and oblique directions. removal use short well-controlled firm pull strokes away from the base of the sulcus you use a firm grasp with moderate to heavy pressure fulcrum pressure increases when transitioning from assessment to removal stroke because remember for assessment stroke it's going to be light tactile pressure so that you can feel as you go over and run over any deviations from normal, whether it's the furcation, whether it's the calculus, whether it's the CEJ, you want to be able to feel that tactilely, whether it's with vibrations or sound. Okay, but that fulcrum pressure will increase. when you go from the assessment to the calculus removal stroke because you're going to need more lateral pressure on this in order to effectively and properly remove this piece of calculus otherwise you're going to burnish it root debridement stroke is used for removing soft deposits from the tooth Grasp is consistent with the amount of lateral pressure that's placed on the blade to the tooth. Light to moderate lateral pressure is dependent on the consistency of the deposit 
Heavy calculus deposits will need more pressure for removal. Let's walk through this picture. So you have your sickle scaler that has a curved tip, has two cutting edges, and it has a pointed tip. Okay, this needs to be adapted you're going to have your anterior third of that instrument needs to be adapted to the tooth at all times. And so in order to do that, you have to roll it. You have to roll it so that it's in line with the tooth and adapt it properly onto that tooth. Otherwise, it's cutting into the papilla. Luckily, this guy doesn't have any, but you know, a normal person is going to have some tissue there, and that point or toe would be cutting into that. Scalers are used for removal of supra gingival calculus, which means calculus above the CEJ or above that gingival margin. The blade has two cutting edges, one here and one here. These lateral surfaces Converge with the face. To form the cutting edges. And the tip of the scaler. Which is a sharp point. The scaler is triangular in cross-section. It has a V-shaped back and the internal angle of 70 to 80 degrees. It has a straight shank and it's used for anteriors if it has a simple straight shank. For complex shank, those are used on the posterior teeth. And types include your curved scalar, which is this one. This is referred to as a sickle. And then you have a straight scalar that's referred to as a jacket. Adaptation of the tip is going to be the third is your scalar. Again, it has a V-shaped back. And the cutting edges are at 70 to 80 degrees. It's used super gingerly. And you need to roll it at all the line angles to keep the toe or tip third, which is a tip third because it's a scalar, adapted to the tooth surface. Your straight scalar or your jacket is used on anterior teeth supra gingerly. 
your curved scalar or sickle scalar is used supra gingivally only. Curettes are used to remove supra gingival and sub gingival calculus and biofilm. They have a rounded back, so it does not traumatize the tissue. They are necessary to use after powered, and powered scaling to remove residual deposits or to, find, or to find scale. The blade has two cutting edges on a curved blade and it has a rounded toe. It's semicircular in cross section with a rounded back internal angle of 70 to 80 degrees on the lateral surfaces. They come in various shank designs. Types include universal curettes, which can be used on any tooth surface. It's ideal for large deposit removal and it has a paired mirror image. Double ended instrument. The instrument face is 90 degrees. It's angled 90 degree angles to the lower shank. The face is perpendicular to the lower shank at the 90 degree angle. Your two working cutting edges are parallel and the blade is sharpened on both sides. Area-specific curettes are designed for adaptation to specific surfaces. They are ideal for fine scaling and root debridement. The working ends are paired. It creates a 70 degree angle. And there's only one working cutting edge. The lower cutting edge is used and the blade is sharpened on one side and around the toe. Those two different types of curette designs, you have your universal, which comes, you know, the terminal shank is at a perpendicular to the face, okay, which creates this 90 degree angle here. Then you have your area specific, which can only be used in one area or yeah, one area of the tooth, like the mesial or the distal. And it comes to a 70 degree angle. So once you close that to go into the pocket, as soon as you open it, it's going to be exactly where you need to be to get that perfect, clean, smooth removal of calculus. So advanced area specific curettes are used in deeper pockets and around curvatures of root surfaces. Furcations as well, and it helps you reach those furcations. And the lower shank varies in length and thickness and the blades vary in length and width. So on your left is your standard Gracie, and then you have your after five. So after fives are usually used when the pocket is greater than five millimeters. That's why it's called after five. The blade width is decreased by 10% and it allows access to pockets with depths beyond five millimeters. Your Mini 5 curette has a terminal shank that's three millimeters longer than the standard blade. 
so it can reach deeper into the periodontal pocket. The width of the Mini 5 Curette is decreased by 10% and the blade length by 50% so that it can adapt to concavities and depressions on the proximal surfaces and root surfaces within furcations. Your Micro Mini 5 has a terminal shank that's 3 millimeters longer and thicker than the standard current blade width. than the standard curette. So the blade width is decreased by 20% and the blade length is 50% shorter. It has a rigid shank. It allows for greater lateral pressure when scaling deep and tenacious pockets and calculus. So now we're going to talk about periodontal files. Your periodontal files include your working file and your finishing file. Your working files are used to crush and fracture heavy calculus into fragments before use of curette. They remove burnished calculus and gross debridements and gross deposits when ultrasonic use is contraindicated. They have multiple cutting edges and blades that are 90 degree angle from the shank and can be used supra and subgingively. It's placed flat against the area to be treated and pressure is applied using a pull stroke only. The area is always followed by curette instrumentation to smooth the surface. Your finishing files are not true files. Scalers are curettes because there are no blades. Examples of your finishing files include a bed bug and diamond coated files. They're used for finishing up root surfaces and accessing furcations. Research suggests diamond coated Diamond-coated curettes may provide tooth surface more compatible with the attachment of periodontal ligament fibroblasts. It's placed 180 to 360 degrees around the tip. Working surfaces place flat against the root surface for adaptation, light pressure. It's used, is used and strokes are multi-directional. The diamond coating is used to remove the calculus. It's placed 180 to 360 degrees around the tip, depending on the manufacturer. For adaptation, the working surface is placed flat against the root surface. You're going to use very light pressure. And for activation, the strokes are multidimensional in a push-pull motion. The scalers or powered instruments, powered instruments. So manual instrumentation was the only method for calculus removal until powered scalers were introduced in 1950. The ultrasonic is a power-driven scaling device that converts high-frequency electrical energy into mechanical energy in the form of rapid vibrations. Your sonic scaler was developed and worked on the same principle but utilized an air turbine as an energy source. The mechanism of action
So power-driven devices convert electrical energy or air pressure into high-frequency sound waves. Those sound waves produce rapid vibrations in the tip to shatter the hard deposits from the tooth surface. Irrigation is going to be water and it's required to reduce heat produced by the vibrating tip. Water also helps lavage the base of the pocket, flushing out blood, debris, and microorganisms. Acoustic turbulence has disruptive effects on surface bacteria. Use of ultrasonic after manual instrumentation helps provide a cleansing and rinsing to promote healing of the soft tissues. Cavitation can form microscopic bubbles that release energy and creates adverse conditions to destroy bacterial cell wall. Variable elements feature variable amplitude and frequency output. Amplitude is the distance of tip movement and frequency is the speed of the tip movement. Indications for use include biofilm removal, extensive stain removal, and super and subgingival calculus removal. Subgingival use also removes attached biofilm and endotoxins from the root surfaces and reduces bacterial load and periodontal pockets. Contraindication if the patient has a communicable disease such as TB and coronavirus, immunosuppression due to organ transplant, or if the patient has a respiratory risk and can aspirate the material and microorganisms from biofilm into the lungs, if the patient has difficulty swallowing, or if they have a cardiac pacemaker. Sonic Vibrations can remove delicate areas where there is remineralization or demineralization. Exposed dental surfaces with high power can damage or remove tooth structure. Thermal damage can occur if tip overheats, and children can be sensitive to ultrasonic vibrations. Vibrations and heat can cause damage to pulp tissue in the primary teeth due to large pulp chambers. Chambers can scratch or chip um, the instrument tip can scratch or chip for restorations. The ultrasonic will damage titanium surfaces on implants. So risk considerations include the impact on hearing as it can damage the ears and can cause muscle skeletal injuries over time. It can also cause sensory neural dysfunction and temporary loss of sensitivity to the fingertips. It can also create aerosols and splatter that contain saliva, blood, microorganisms, debris, and other infectious material. A pre-procedural rinse is recommended before beginning power instrumentation and high volume evacuator. Types include sonic scalers and ultrasonic scalers. Sonic scalers are driven by compressed air from the dental unit. They're less powerful than ultrasonic scalers. They vibrate between three thousand CPS. Tip movement is elliptical but varies depending on the tip and the type of scalar. All surfaces of the tip are active and heat is not generated by the active tip. So here is a nice chart that shows you the difference between sonic and ultrasonic. So ultrasonic, you have your piezoelectric and your magnetostrictive, and these are the two that you typically tend to see in dental offices. Your magnetostrictive is 18,000 to 45,000 CPS. Your piezoelectric is 25,000 to 50,000. 
and then you have your elliptical motion and your linear motion. And here all sides are activated and here only the lateral sides are activated. Restrictive ultrasonic scalars are driven by electrical currents. They utilize inserts or stacks of metal in the handpiece. So this right here is your stack. It's more powerful than sonic scalars. The frequency ranges from 18,000 to 45 CPS. Tip movement is elliptical pattern and all surfaces of the tip are active. Water helps cool the heat that's generated. The equipment includes electrical generator, hand picnic assembly, interchangeable tips, and foot pedal. Unit preparation, you're gonna flush the water line for two minutes. You're gonna select the appropriate insert and fill with water. You're going to select the appropriate power setting and adjust the water setting. device is driven by electrical currents. It uses a ceramic rod and crystal transducer, which is housed in the handpiece to activate the tip. Frequency ranges from 25,000 to 50,000 CPS. Tip movement is the linear pattern forward and backward. Only the lateral surface of the tip is active. Equipment includes a generator, handpiece, assembly, scaling tips, and foot pedal. Your piezoelectric unit, so unit preparation, you want to establish power and water connections, flush the line for two minutes, and select the appropriate tip. Screw the tip onto the handpiece using a tip wrench, and then you're going to select your power setting and adjust the water setting. tip is crucial. Standard diameter tips are used for moderate to heavy calculus removal. Thin diameter tips are used for biofilm debridement and light calculus. And deep pockets. The, the shape straight design has a simple shank and is used universally. So your complex design has multiple bends, which allows easy access to line angles and proximal surfaces. Your left and right insert helps better adapt to root concavities and the power setting use the lowest power. Proper wear setting will increase the halo of fine mist without drips of water. You wanna grasp and establish a light grasp with light pressure. Intraoral fulcrum is not required because of, is not required, but a gentle finger rest is used to stabilize and guide that tip. Keep the side of the instrument tip closely adapted to, to surface. If the tip goes straight, deactivate the tip and remove it from the embrasure space then respond as necessary. And then you're going to reposition the instrument. Activation, you're going to use overlapping vertical, horizontal, and oblique strokes. You want to keep the instrument tip closely adapted to the tooth surface. And use a terminal two to three millimeters of tip on the lateral surfaces only. Keep the tip in contact with the tooth at all times. You wanna use overlapping vertical, horizontal, and oblique strokes.
So dexterity development is necessary to develop this dexterity and strength. The purpose of squeezing is to develop strength and control. Therapy putty or a softball can be used to exercise a hand. Stretching will strengthen the finger and hand muscles and develop control of finger movement using the rubber band can be used to do exercises together. So use band on joint between first phalanx and second phalanx. Pen and pencil exercises help overlap, correct, modify pen grasp, and practice instrument rolling. Being a pencil With modified pin grasp, plays, play with the rubber band around the grasp and keep the fingers together at one time. Use a mouth mirror and the modified pin grasp in the non-dominant hand. Redefine use of mouth mirror and cotton pliers. Practice turning the mirror with the fingers and place picking up the cotton pellets using indirect vision. Calculus detection is used to help develop tactile sensitivity. Try using the Explorer with your eyes closed on your type it on so that you can get comfortable and get used to know what you're feeling. Know what you're looking for when you're down there with your Explorer. This tool consists of an explorer and a mounted texture tiles that stimulate different tooth structures in varying degrees of calculus. Risk factors for trauma include poor posture for extended periods of time and repetitive movements. Trauma prevention includes exercise, perform chair side and in between patients, stretching the fingers and wrists after returning an instrument to the cassette and stretching releases stress and improves posture and counteracts repetitive movement. So here you can see how they're reaching for the instrument in the cassette and then the person begins to do shoulder exercises wrist stretches, finger stretches, and shaking. Documentation of instrument selection and instrument technique needs to be placed in the patient record. It can provide guidance for future hygiene appointments. It's important to document areas of patient dentition that requires more careful attention or requires a special instrument. You want to document any instruments avoided during the patient or avoided due to the patient contraindications or discomfort, such as ultrasonic scalar due to dentinal hypersensitivity. Factors to teach the patient include the benefits and risks of using certain instruments, why it's necessary to use a variety of instruments, what sensations and experiences to expect during the use of such instruments, and how the patient can cooperate to help you be more efficient and effective.